Well, we'll go ahead and get started and thank everyone for being here. So tonight's program is one we're uh, really been looking forward to for some time, um, thinking about this history. And I will say a few words and then introduce our speaker this evening. Uh, first and foremost, we want to thank our sponsor, the Regional Arts and Culture Council, which supports the creative economy in Greater Portland by equitably providing funding and services to artists and art organizations, managing and growing a diverse, nationally acclaimed public art program, and developing long-lasting public and private partnerships. We appreciate that the Regional Arts and Culture Council recognizes the, the research and public sharing of history as part of the artistic makeup of our region and has supported the projects that our speaker will be talking about this evening. So thanks very much, Rack. We appreciate you. We want to spend a minute to think about the fact that wherever we are here in Oregon and indeed anywhere in the Americas, we are on indigenous land. This map is a map that is taken from our exhibit Experience Oregon, which we look forward to welcoming everyone back to again when it's safe to do so. And this is a map that shows many of the languages of the indigenous peoples of this region. I'm speaking to you this evening from Portland, Oregon, which is located on the traditional homelands of the Multnomah, Kaplamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Wallala Bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. I always wanna take a moment at the beginning of our programs and reflect on the fact that we are on indigenous land and that the history of this place is many, many thousands of years old. And the indigenous peoples of these places where we all are have ongoing and ancestral relationships with the place, with the animals, with the plants, and so we encourage everyone to take the time to learn about the indigenous peoples of the place where you are. The best place, of course, is the indigenous nations themselves, the native nations of the United States and elsewhere, uh, excuse me, native nations in the United States and elsewhere. Many of them have their own websites and education programs and museums, and we encourage you to spend time uh, learning from peoples about their relationships with place as indigenous people. I want to make sure everyone knows about a fantastic upcoming program. Tickets are still available. Uh, historian Joanne Freeman will be giving a virtual Hatfield lecture on Tuesday, March 16th. We'll be delivering it to your homes just like tonight. Uh, this program we think will be particularly fascinating these days because Dr. Freeman has written a book called The Field of Blood, Violence in Congress and the Road to the Civil War. And it's a really incredible look at the decades leading up to the Civil War and how fighting was actually happening in, the, in and around the United States uh, Capitol um, and including some actual very violent fights. Um, she's an incredible historian who has done a lot of uh, writing and some public speaking about the relationships between that era and the one in which we're living right now. Um, and so we hope that you can join us for this uh, incredible lecture on Tuesday, March 16th. Like I said, tickets are available still. So tonight's program is brought to us by Bill Lasher, who is a Portland-based author and freelance journalist. Uh, this, book, this work that he's speaking to us about tonight is part of his upcoming book, Border War, a notorious LA police chief, a rural sheriff, and the struggle for the American dream. Uh, it will be published by the Chicago Review Press. His previous book, Eve of a Hundred Midnights, was published in 2016 and recounts two foreign correspondents' dramatic escape from beyond World War II's front lines and was an Oregon Book Awards finalist. He wrote the six-part Great Depression season of the award-winning podcast, American History Tellers, and his journalism has appeared in such outlets as Fortune, The Guardian, Atlas Obscura, Portland Monthly, High Country News, Oregon Public Broadcasting, The Oregonian, and Pacific Standard. Uh, he has a website, lasheratlarge.com, where you can find more about that and his other work. And we at the Oregon Historical Society just want to say how much we appreciate the work that Bill does for deep, deep research and public engagement in the historical narratives that he brings to light. 
So thanks very much, Bill, for bringing this conversation to our audience, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone for being here. It's uh, really great to have you spending uh, part of your evening with me. I, uh, you know, I hope that you'll be as interested in this topic as I am. I find uh, that as much as researching it that, I, that I've done, I've, it's really stirred me. And I actually, I, I took note of the, the reference of the acknowledgement of the indigenous land that we're on when Eliza was speaking, because I think, you know, I'm sitting here talking about migration and talking about um, who belongs or who was considered belonging in either Oregon or California or the United States during uh, the Great Depression, uh, during the present. And I think it's, uh, it's interesting to think about the fact that all of this discussion of belonging and migration and movement almost elides who was here before any of these people got here. Uh, so that's just, uh, that just really struck me. Um, I'd like to thank the Historical Society for having me um, as I think Eliza alluded to, but maybe she didn't. I had, about a year ago, I talked to her about this and I think it was the last discussion that we had before the, uh, or at least that I had with anyone in a meeting before the pandemic. And so it's pretty strange to be here now and somehow this topic is still very relevant. Um, I'd also like to thank the, uh, Regional Arts and Culture Council for, for having me here, or for supporting my ability to be here. I think that as we recover and as we move past, uh, you know, beating this pandemic and get into the longer term recovery, recovering culture will be really important. So that kind of support's really welcome. Anyway, um, we can start, go on to the next slide and um, want to talk about this idea of, um, actually the slide after this, but um, so um, this one. And um, I want to talk about this idea that, that we're in a global crisis with a local impact. Um, this is a picture of the uh, Farmers Supply Co-op in Nyssa, Oregon, Eastern Oregon. It's not particularly directly related to um, uh, the, the border blockade, but I thought it was kind of moving because it kind of reminds me of this idea that um, everything I'm going to be talking about tonight is this idea of the tension between the local and the national, between coordinating a federal response to forces that don't really care about borders and don't care about boundaries and don't care about whether one person lives in Oregon and another person lives in California or one person lives in Idaho and another in Oregon. Um, and you know, I really wanna acknowledge this idea of the, uh, the unique pressures that that are forced on us when there's this sort of tension between the local and the regional and then the national. And I started working on this in this period that we've had in the last five years of, um, you know, I actually started working on this before the pandemic in about 2018 was when I first heard about the, uh, the subject that I'm gonna be talking about tonight. And as some of you may know, that was a time of really rampant xenophobia, um, definitely a lot of discussions that continue today about policing and police abuses and who gets policed and who get, who has laws enforced upon them and who doesn't. Um, and of course, about how we treat the poor and whether we give the poor the same access to the opportunities that people who start from a higher leg up have. Um, you know, those kinds of discussions are ongoing and, you know, I could be talking about migration and immigration, uh, but tonight I'll be talking more about domestic migration. And while this isn't really about, you know, racial and ethnic and national identities, I think um, all of those forces, I just wanna keep that in mind because all those forces will have informed the discussion and the events that I'm gonna describe, but they're not exactly directly related. I can, I can talk about that in questions a little bit more though. Um, but, I want to take just like a second more framing this discussion I'm going to have to describe, um, to really, to really like plant the flag here. Great Depression, in my opinion, wasn't really a financial crisis. It wasn't a manufacturing crisis. It wasn't an agricultural crisis. It wasn't a labor crisis. It wasn't an urban crisis. It wasn't a rural crisis. It definitely wasn't an American crisis. The Great Depression was a global human crisis. Yes, of course, it was all of the types of crises that I mentioned, but though it was world-rending and though it completely changed our life, the depression was felt 
no less acutely in Klamath Falls or Nyssa or Portland than it was in New York or Omaha or Cleveland. And I think that's just something to keep in mind that like every single single thing we talk about is happening at this sort of grand larger scale and then happening at this really low local scale. It's happening even at that you know small family level. So when we talk about this police blockade that I'm gonna be discussing, one of the critiques that comes up a lot is like, well, it didn't seem to be that big or it was kind of small or not that many people got arrested. And really, I don't think that's so significant. I'll get back into my reasoning why, because it was still something that would be tremendously unheard of if, you know, I, I live in Portland, I live really close to uh, the interstate bridge in Vancouver. I mean, I can't imagine what would happen if I went up to, you know, go to the waterfront up there and get, you know, stopped by the police because I didn't have enough money or there's too much pressure happening on Washington situations or whatever reasoning. Um, so let's go to the next slide and I'll set a little bit of the scene here. Um, so this man pictured here is James Edgar Davis. In 1936, he was the chief of the Los Angeles Police Department. It was actually his second stint as the LAPD chief. Um, he was a real authoritarian, a real gun nut. He was really obsessed with this idea of training the LAPD in firearm skill, he, in competing on firearms. He would do this trick where he would shoot cigarettes out of volunteers' mouths. And you know they'd stand still, they'd light it, usually be a subordinate, and he'd shoot it. Sometimes he had other people do the shooting, but um, he believed you know that the most important thing was order, was enforcing the law, and keeping Los Angeles, in his case, safe. But of course, the order he sought and the safety he sought was the safety of Los Angeles's business class of the. Merchant and Manufacturers Association, of the Chamber of Commerce, of people who were in charge in Los Angeles. Um, I'm not gonna get into all these details because this is the Oregon Historical Society, but Davis would end up leaving, uh, kind of forced out after a scandal that also pushed out LA Mayor Frank Shaw, uh, but that's two years after the events I'm describing. Um, so, you know, we're back here 85 years ago tonight, uh, February 4th, and uh, 136 Los Angeles police officers have just arrived at 16 different checkpoints all around the borders of California. They're in Del Norte County in uh, California near Brookings. They're in uh, Siskiyou County in Weed and Wairica. They're kind of in Modoc County, and this is a big tension that I'll get into actually in the book that I'm working on, not so much tonight, but there, there's a tension between the local sheriff and the, uh, the, the Los Angeles Police Department contingent there. Anyway, they're all along the border of Nevada on every highway. Uh, they're all across Arizona. They're in Blythe. They're you know, near Yuma. They're stopping people traveling by car into the state of California. They're stopping um, people on railroads they're slowing down their squad cars alongside uh, uh freight cars and looking into them to see if there's people you know if there's uh homeless people and transients trying to uh forgetting the word in it but you know train hoppers and and try and get get in on the on the box cars into california um so what's going on is um it's been about, um, you know, we're about five years in, or six years into the Great Depression, almost almost seven, and uh, there's this increasing strain of migration into into California. And um, I, I, sorry, I've kind of lost my place here, but that's okay. Um, I want to um, just sort of just sit here a second with this idea of you know the reason I mentioned. Davis and his sort of identity as this gun nut is because of the, the issue of him emphasizing uh, force and strength and, and emphasizing the training and the use of firearms really has a lot to do with why this blockade was something that he felt he could do. You know, he felt like he could solve this issue. He felt like he didn't really care about constitutionality. He didn't care about civil liberties. 
He didn't care about anything else that might hamper his vision of law and order and his allies' vision of law and order. What mattered to James Edgar Davis was security. He was rampantly anti-communist and he wanted this attitude to extend to his subordinates working in this border patrol. He wanted them to stop anyone they deemed looked like they couldn't afford to be in California or they didn't have a job or they might have a criminal record. Obviously, as you might imagine, that was somewhat ambivious, ambivalently enforced. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is a little scene from one of the Hoovervilles here in Oregon. I got it uh, from the Oregon Historical Society. Thank you guys. Um, and I want to just sit on it for a while. This is a, sort of a delivery of goods to a local boss here because, uh, you know, sort of the issue at hand again is this local versus global, this national versus regional situation. And it's also a informal relief response to the Great Depression and a formal standardized sort of uniform response. That's sort of the central tension of, of what I'd like to talk about tonight. So let's go to the next slide. Here we have the construction of the Bonneville Dam, right? This is something that gets developed um, after Roosevelt comes into office, after he starts the um, New Deal. And, and this is one of his, you know, work relief programs that is a big piece of, you know, of the work that he's gonna do. Once Roosevelt's there leading the country, the issue is no longer, you know, let's have a little piece of response to the Great Depression here in California and another response to the Great Depression here in Oregon. And then let's see how Los Angeles does it. And maybe this private business wants to throw in and maybe someone, you know, some local charity is gonna participate in helping people. This now becomes a national response. And, you know, I just was interested in this image as a real sign of the idea that this was this huge, large situational thing versus the sort of ad hoc situation that's happening in the Hoovervilles and in, you know, the city streets in the first couple of years of the Great Depression. So um, I want to go back and look at one of these one of these local efforts that uh, that arose early on. So the next slide will have that. Uh, so early in the uh, in the depression, the East Side Commercial Club and Chamber of Commerce and some other private entities here in Portland developed an early response that was known as the Portland Plan, which is similar to you know some of the more recent uh, urban planning efforts. But the idea of the Portland Plan was again, one of these ad hoc responses to the Great Depression. It was this idea of responding with, you know, whatever people wanted to chip in. There was this raw, raw, strong, just really energetic, you know, sort of efforts in the Oregonian and in other places to try to stir up a sort of civic commitment to fixing this ravage that's been happening now. You know, this is, around 1932, it's two or three years in and, and people are really, really getting desperate. So the Portland plan asked people to pledge to support, you know, the development of, you know, maybe they'll, they'll pay to have their, their storefront revitalized and painted or even their house painted. And, and that way, if people pledge this money for the Portland plan, then people will gather and, and you know, improve their places. So we have, again, the sense of these casual informal responses to the Great Depression and yet, you know, nothing's happening. Uh, so we're gonna go on to the next slide. And, you know, by 1932, we have unemployment rising. We have, you know, the consequent result of homelessness also rising. We have no healing, you know. By the summer of 1932, we have the bonus expeditionary force that is started here in Portland from one of the local um, Hoovervilles out there in Sullivan Gulch, where veterans who had been promised or had been at least seeking their uh, bonus for their service in the uh, First World War and in the Spanish-American War want to get paid this bonus early. And a uh, unemployed cannery worker from here in Portland decides, okay, veterans, let's start mar marching on Washington, D.C. And as news of this march spreads, this gathers and 25,000 people march on Washington, D.C. and are there all summer in 1932. And, and you know, by some accounts, uh, 
the march and of course the violent response to it by the federal government uh, outside the Capitol is strong and it's possibly one of the reasons that Herbert Hoover would lose the election. But, you know, I just wanna focus again on this because, okay, we have this on the on the right, we have the, the Ross Island Bridge and we have this Hooverville down there. And on the bottom left, you see a sort of close up of what it says. I don't know how well you can read it. And you know, you guys are all on screen, so maybe you can read it, but you have this idea of the Ross Island Bridge commissary, you know, and what's the other word I've, I, I haven't looked at it in a few days, uh, so just Hooverville. So, so, you know, we have again, this ad hoc formalized structure of response, these, these almost completely organized towns in the form of these Hoovervilles, but they're also on borrowed land. They're, you know, just like another step up from the type of homeless encampments we might see today. They're a little bit more organized, but they're organized from within rather than without. And that kind of thing can't really last. I mean, it's, always tenuous it's always at risk of any number of forces damaging it so by then in 1932 of course fdr wins and you know in the next slide um we'll we'll get to this i'm actually just going to rush through, through some of those early new deal you know developments i think you all know about the new deal you know and all know about the beginning of it you know about the work um the ccc which we're seeing on the left the civilian conservation corps here we see on the bottom right, you see Roosevelt here at Union Station in Portland campaigning uh, for his first election, I believe, from that from that uh, that image. And then on the top, it's an interesting image for two reasons. One is because here we see the band playing in the South Park blocks of Portland, right by the Oregon Historical Society, you know, right there at the uh, the Roosevelt statue that was sort of in the news this summer, but. What this band is, is the Portland, um, I think it's the Federal Symphony, Symphony. I don't know if I have the exact term right at the moment, but, um, but what I want to mention here is um, that this is one of many programs funded through the New Deal. Um, you know, this is a outgrowth of the State uh, Emergency Relief administration, which is Oregon's sort of agency that's a part of the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, which was set up during the New Deal in the, the first 100 days of the Roosevelt administration. And it's, you know, this emergency rapid response to provide quick economic relief throughout the country administered by states, but paid for, you know, from the federal level and, you know, uh, trickled down. Uh, trickle down is probably not the right word to use in this case, but administered locally, but through this federal program. And the reason it's important to this topic of the bum blockade is that one of the agencies that was set up by the Federal Emergency Relief Act was the um, Federal Transportation Service, which, uh, so, sorry, the Federal Transient Service, which is coordinating aid throughout the, 50, the 48 states to uh, economically motivated migrants moving throughout the country. At the time, aid is being administered by various county agencies and state governments to their residents. But there are thousands upon thousands of people who are seeking aid for one reason or another in communities that they're not from. And through the Federal Transit Service, this aid is able to be sort of distributed on a somewhat universal basis. The problem is that once 1935 rolls around, the FERA is due to sunset, and the Federal Transit uh, Tr Transient Service is going to be liquidated if the legislation is not reenacted. Unfortunately, to pay for Roosevelt's second New Deal and to pay for the um, Social Security Act and the Works Projects Administration. Um, they got a cut somewhere. And one of the cuts comes to FERA. And that means that suddenly all these state emergency relief administrations are out of the federal money supporting their efforts to pay for relief. Um, and that's really the root of tensions over who's coming into various states, especially you know, once 1935 is here, 
where at the height of the environmental catastrophe in the Dust Bowl in the Southern Great Plains in places like Nebraska, and Oklahoma, and Kansas, and other states that have been overfarmed and monocultured and overgrazed right in the middle of a drought and have lost tremendous amounts of topsoil, can't recover. And there's this, you know, just devastating cycle of storms and dust storms pushing people off the land combined with the economic crisis that's happening. So tens of thousands of people are moving across the country um, and nobody wants them. Um, and I, I think it's sort of important uh, to look at what's going to happen when that, when when you dismantle a big federal program like uh, the FERA, you've got 48 states providing aid where once it was just the country, you know, once the funding was just coming from the federal government, and you have 3,000 counties all developing different aid regimes or maybe not developing them, and all developing different ways to replace this once centralized process to aid transients, um, and you know, this is a big piece, not just of why California wants to start keeping migrants out of California, but it's also a big piece of why neighboring states decide that they might be a little bothered by the reaction that California has. I mean, there's this concern of how do we pay for this? Who's responsible for paying for this? And if you get rid of these people here, where are they going to go? What, what, how, how are we going to pay for them? Um, this may sound familiar, but anyway, we'll, we'll continue. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, this is uh, just a little bit more about what's happening you know, with this when, when we liquidated the, uh, the federal transit service. There's protests like this happening everywhere. In this case, it's in Clackamas County, where there is this funeral for the for the relief worker. As, as I could tell from when I looked at the information about this picture, I don't think it was a symbolic protest of the of, of in, in this funeral. I don't believe it's an actual funeral. But what we're talking about in 1935 is the death of this one aid regime and this sort of chaotic, uncertain future that's kind of coming for everybody. So while amazing work relief programs are sort of on their way and programs that a lot of people are very enthusiastic about, a lot of other programs are being dismantled and being left out. So there's this, this sort of ongoing question of what's happening from the federal level and what's happening locally. And then another question of like, do we provide direct relief to people or do we provide work relief, which is sort of what the Works Projects Administration was, of course. And of course, it was also a program that left out quite a bit of people. You know, if you were a woman in a family, you would not be eligible for that same type of aid because it would be the head of the household who'd be getting the work relief in the WPA. So there's a lot of other questions about how things went about in the WPA. Okay, so I got one more slide coming here about stats um, and sort of what's going on in scene setting. And this is a little cartoon that was actually from 1938. So it's a little ahead of where we are uh, from the Oregonian. And it's sort of on the occasion of the release of a report by uh, a guy named Stanberry, who is the uh, administrator of the state planning board and he's talking about the um he's just released a study on migration into oregon and i think that this issue of the net gain that you see here is is sort of a good one to keep in your head we're talking about you know as economic and environmental catastrophes intertwined there's around the country there's hundreds of thousands of economically displaced people seeking opportunities in lands distant from their homes now of course there's also people going into the states that are losing people. I think there's been some studies recently. I know I saw one from the uh, National Bureau of Economic Research that talks about the fact that actually net migration wasn't tremendously different in terms of raw numbers in uh, the 1930s as compared to the uh, 1920s. But there's some different breakdowns as far as like where that migration is happening and how many people are going and, and when exactly within those periods of time happening and i think stanbury provides one of these great sets of like early numbers of this you know this is in oregon we're looking at ninety-six thousand people coming into the state between 1930 and 1937 essentially the length of those that sort of first really intense period of the great depression and that's 19 ninety-six thousand new people 
Now, some of that is, of course, births, but the birth rate is down, again, probably because of the Great Depression. But there's also 81,000 people coming in as a result of um, migration. And then in 1935 and 36 alone, 26,000 new migrants to Oregon. So that's a huge influx of people. There are similar numbers, obviously a little larger in California and in, in Washington, but you know, even here, there's all already these other pressures. And then suddenly you have this, you have this rule of, you know, or you have, you have this, um, this change that's happening in the with the federal trans, trans transient service and then the uh, uh, the settlement rules of one of the other changes I forgot to mention was this idea that while the federal federal transient service was in action, there had to be a uniform sort of rule for like how long you had to be settled in a particular state to to get aid. So. Uh, as soon as that goes away, states start making different rules for how long you have to be there. So for example, in Oregon, before the spring of 1935, you only had to be here for one year before you could start requesting economic relief. Once this support network from FURA goes away, that rule changes to three years of residency. So if you're a migrant and you've just come here, and you've got to move because your next job opportunity is somewhere else. You can never establish that kind of residency, and therefore you can never be if it, it, you can never be eligible for the relief that you're seeking. So, I think that's something that's important to chew on is, is this idea that who we are and like what what gives us that justification to receive sort of an ability to get the support of the state is completely different in every single locale. And once that's different, there's no ability to find certainty. And there's this just complete sense of, I just got to scrape through to get you know, my next meal or to get to the next city or to get out of this city where now I can't get a job and they're kicking me out. Okay. So, For decades, I want to go back to California for a second. For decades, California has been driving immigration, uh, migration. California has been seeking it. Los Angeles's business leaders, its Chamber of Commerce and the Merchant and Manufacturers Association and others are really pushing this campaign known as the they're backed by an organization they set up called the All Year Club, which is to advertise Southern California as this idyllic, bountiful destination that is accessible all year round, that's productive all year round, that you can go, you know, like, and, and if you go to California, you'll have opportunity. It is the golden state. Of course, it's golden for certain people. And there is a lot of limits to who they really want to come into California. But in any event, Los Angeles has been widely publicizing this idea that people should come to California. Well, now there's all these people who are looking for opportunity and they've been hearing for years in movies and in magazine ads and in newspapers that California is this land of opportunity. So fear has sunsetted, the Federal Transit Service has sunsetted, and suddenly these business elites that had spent all this time pushing California as this place of opportunity are suddenly saying, like, I, I don't know if I like who's hearing this message. Uh, and without this state transient service to to manage them, there's there's sort of no way to respond. And so you see this in the fall of 1935. You see this increasing rapid pitch of what are we going to do? How do we keep out you know poor people? Uh, in the spring, just after Ferris closure, the state almost made it illegal to. Um, enter the state if you're an indigent person that that law was not passed in the state senate but it there's all sorts of emergency efforts that are conceived then the chamber of commerce meets with james davis and one of his deputies in the fall of uh, 1935 and they devise a new plan what if we start talking about this what they start terming through 
publications like the Los Angeles Times and the Herald Examiner, but they start terming invading hordes of hobos and bums and uh, vagrants. And they use all these pejorative terms for poor people to imply that there is just a seething, evil, criminal tide of invading migrants headed for California, wanting to just pick at California. What they don't mention is that Frank Shaw, the mayor of LA, is himself someone who migrated to Los Angeles. They don't mention that James Davis arrived in Los Angeles in 1910, poor with only his army uniform on his back and sort of worked his way up. Of course, they never mention any of that stuff. They, they just start working this campaign of this, again, this tide of criminality that's invading. There was also a lot of red baiting that's going on. Of course, Davis is known for uh, some of his subordinates, red squads at the time, and, you know, beating the heads of suspected communists and also alleging that many people are communists. And that attitude also works its way into this, this, this idea that a invading, just absolutely sinister force coming for California, ready to undermine it, starts to get on this tenor of, of communists. In fact, there's an anti-crime conference in 1935 in Sacramento where Davis even alleges that intermarriage is a plot by the Soviets to undermine Californian stability. It's, it's wild. Um, and all of this starts informing the sort of tenor of the newspapers and public attitudes about transients and the Great Depression and um, migrants from the Dust Bowl and other states. You even start to see this term, you know, Okies and Arkies, even though not everyone's from Arkansas or Oklahoma being applied. And it starts to even get a little racialized, even though, again, these are mostly white people coming here. Although when the bum blockade starts, um, it's certainly applied inordinately to other people. And of course, it's been about four years by this point since uh, these same Chamber of Commerce leaders sort of led the drive to deport hundreds of thousands of not just Mexican citizens living in Los Angeles, but Mexican Americans. So there is a lot of xenophobia to this, even though sort of what we're talking about here with this blockade is more about migration from the Midwest and the Southern Great Plains. Okay, so we'll go to the next, uh, next slide. So back here, it's February 1936. This is from the Klamath Herald. Um, these are four of these blockade officers, obviously Chile and Radio Go in Doris, California. Uh, just north of, uh, just south of, uh, I think south of Medford. I'll have to double check the map. I, I know that Alturas used to be called Doris Bridge, so I always get a little like confused by the uh, the, the geography here when I'm not looking at it. Um, anyway, they're charged again, as I mentioned earlier. They're charged with this sort of idea of stopping anyone who is appears to be poor or doesn't have means or a promised job in California or may have a criminal record, although they have some ability to use teletype machines and radio to get back to Los Angeles to a sort of central headquarters to find out about people's records. But they're really just looking for reasons to stop people. You know, if a, if a nice packer drives by, they're not gonna stop them. If a jalopy drives by and you know, it's overflowing with people and they're dirty and they're, they might stop them and start asking questions about how much money they have in their pockets. What's their destination? Do they have a job that they're getting? Where are they going? Um, so Davis's legionnaires, as this sort of alludes to, or, you know, they're also called, as I sort of referred earlier without much mention, they're called the, the bum blockade. You know, as they start stopping people, um, they're, they're giving them a choice. They can arrest them. They can stay in jail, which might be nice if you're in Northern California and it's February, you know, they can put you up in a jail cell for a night, but then you're still gonna get arrested and sent back across California. Although you'll see reports both in, in regional newspapers talking about it and in some social workers. Um, there was this one social worker in California who sort of traveled on his own and quote unquote bummed around to uh, experience what's happening, and you know, you see that, for example, in um, the, one of these one of these jails was in Siskiyou County, 
and it was just a bare room and they were given a bucket of water and some bread and you know there's there's not a lot of records of exactly how accurate any of either these news reports are or the police's claims or the um, social workers reports but the, the, there's some pretty pretty intense detail out there anyhow um they're giving us choice you can be arrested you can turn around and leave or you know maybe you go work at a rock quarry but and of course if you have a warrant or something you might get taken in for something else but here's what's happening let's say you've traveled across the country and you spent every penny you have on fixing your car or on gas or on food and for maybe your family and anything else you might need and maybe you're working along the way you don't have any money left to go back anywhere and if you do try to go back where are you going to go you're coming from all these other communities that also don't want you and this is where we start to get into Oregon's reaction you know there's this uncertain journey that's where you've been scraping and spending whatever you can and suddenly it's made all the more precarious and regardless of what you decide the LAPD is going to do one more thing James Davis was also obsessed with fingerprinting. He was obsessed with all forms of formalizing police work. And if, you know, he liked the, you know, he was big on implementing radios and squad cars. And again, I mentioned the guns and motorcycle squadrons and things like that. And he did, back in LA, he did the dragnet. So one other thing is he fingerprinted. Everyone stopped, not just people who were stopped and arrested and who were actually illegally moving through the state, but people who were just considered, you know, people who stopped and then they went along, they're still fingerprinted or people who turned back, even if they decided to be turned back, they're fingerprinted. And this had an added effect. Suddenly they have a record, it may not be an arrest record, but when someone at a relief society, again, a non-centralized relief society in some other county, three states away or even just across the state or even two cities away looks them up and they radio into their headquarters or whatever so anyway, you have no record you have your fingerprints on file with the fbi or on file with the lapd we can't give you aid so there's all of these cascading effects that just start to make it harder and harder for anyone who's attempting to enter california and this is what i mean about this idea that it may not seem like a large operation it may not seem like the most you know dramatic thing there's a reason many of us haven't heard of it because there weren't thousands of people beaten and arrested at the california border there wasn't a wall there there wasn't you know there was there was some violence a lot of it was not documented but we just don't know about so much of it um but this other issue about where do they go once they're turned around is why people in places like klamath falls or grants pass or medford or even Salem or Bend or Portland or smaller towns. This is why all of them are also starting to get concerned. They start to realize, well, what happens? What happens if I, how do we manage these people that are suddenly turned away? So that's a piece of it. And then also if you're in these Southern towns, you know, if you're in Southern Oregon, you know, you're in this quote unquote mythical state of Jefferson. And of course that movement's gonna get started in a few years after this episode, but you're, you've got more of an identity almost with Wairika and Crescent City and Alturas and places like that than you do with Portland or Salem or you know anywhere else in Oregon. So these are places where you might go work on a farm or these are places where you might go shopping or maybe you're a doctor and you serve people, you know, in Lakeview and people are coming over into into Modoc County to work as doctors and lawyers. You've got also, although, you know, this is a disruptive event. This is in the United States. This is a hard border suddenly blocking travel from one state to the next. Um, so I wanna move on to the next, uh, next slide to sort of start to talk about the way that people are responding. So we have on the right, we have Governor Charles Martin and on the left, we have the Portland mayor at the time, uh, Carson. And Martin is a Democrat, but he's what he calls himself a Hoover Democrat. And he um, is opposed to many aspects of the New Deal. And he reacts to the bum blockade, not with this idea that 
oh, this is an unconscionable thing that California is doing. But with this idea that, as he tells newspapers, Oregon has enough mystery, uh, sorry, enough misery without having to care for these unwelcome visitors. And Martin, you know, he even takes the time to draw the connection between this blockade and what's going on in the mid thirties in Europe. You know, he argues that if Davis's operation is allowed to continue, other states might lose, might close their borders in response to California. And suddenly you'll have border guards on every border throughout the country. And he thinks that that's akin to the sort of creeping fascism in Europe. And of course the first stages of the Holocaust and the, the sort of flight of Jewish refugees from Germany and other Nazi occupied areas. Um, and he's just not interested in this idea of assisting hard pressed migrants. In fact, just three weeks earlier, there'd been a uh, camp closed down in Roseburg, a, a FIRA relief camp. And when the uh, Oregon Daily Journal reported on it, the way that Martin responds isn't, you know, just it's a matter of state management. His response is that he just sees no daylight between the idea of a transient and a tramp. He just doesn't think it's worth getting formal about it. He doesn't care. You know, I guess he'd be one of these people today who'd say, I don't want to get all PC about it. He pretty much just despises this transient population as much as James Davis or anyone in California. It's just like, he just doesn't want Oregon to have to deal with it. And he just worries about, you know, when the newspapers start covering the blockade, he protests, but he protests because he doesn't want all of these migrants, quote unquote, dumped on Oregon's doorstep. Um, you know, even just a few weeks earlier in late January, even the Multnomah County Commission had discussed kicking transits out of out of Multnomah County, which is going to be particularly interesting when we start talking about Portland's response in just a second. But I um, want to move on to the next slide just because it's an interesting little newspaper item from Klamath Falls. So, you know, I think you see this kind of response. Klamath Falls, this is the, the Herald down there. They they describe it as stubborn LA. Um, I don't know how, again, I don't know how well you can read this, but um, it's this idea that, um, you know, they taught, they really emphasize the, the unconstitutionality, but again, the, the discourse is sort of like more about how sort of like resistant Los Angeles is being. And I just find it to be that, you know, the issues at hand here aren't so much about what is happening on like a human scale. It's, it's about what's happening to, you know, the different municipalities here. And again, it goes back to these various like almost fiefdoms of local jurisdictions, sort of managing the the, the disintegration of one of these federal relief programs. Um, anyway, we can move on to the next slide. Um, So right as all of this is happening, about seven days into, I think it's February 12th, Lincoln's birthday, Hoover, President Herbert Hoover comes to town and he is hosted by the Multnomah Republicans and he gives a talk and he hammers on the New Deal and he's hammering sort of on the same idea of the sort of confusion in the New Deal and, and what he terms disorganization. And he, you know, Hoover is not one for government regulation by any means of the imagination, but he's sort of articulating this idea as sort of like a, the idea that what's happening now with this quote unquote second new deal is causing all this confusion for these local municipalities. Um, it's also, I think worth noting that when Hoover was here, he was staying with uh, the publisher and the editor of the, um, uh, or with the, the publisher of the the Oregonian and, and it, that I, I'm certain will shape some of the Oregonians coverage of this topic. It's also, I think, important to note that it's an election year and um, Hoover's really, you know, what Hoover's gonna do and what he's gonna promote in terms of who's running to face Roosevelt is gonna start to amp up and become more of an issue and more of a topic throughout the year. Anyway, I just thought sort of an interesting slide. We can move on to the next one. Um, so even though Hoover's there and trying to sort of, he's not really explicitly, as near as I can tell from reading his speech, he's not explicitly discussing the border blockade. And in fact, 
I also couldn't find much else from, um, at least from federal officials that I've seen so far, that really addresses it. You're seeing it maybe from US attorneys in various states. So that's about the closest you get to seeing anyone at the federal level, even like addressing the topic. It just is not something that is, is coming up too much. And again, in my research, that's what I'm going to say. Meanwhile, you are getting some kind of response. This is a uh, Quincy Scott illustration that was in the Oregonian. And it's sort of like a simmering response from the newspapers. First, they're running wire copy, and then they're um, starting to get more negative. The Oregonian is, you know, this Republican paper, and it's not quite as like concerned about the humanity involved, although it's pretty critical of, of what's happening too. It's more kind of like, oh, what a mess. And like, you know, this is, this is what we could have predicted would happen. And there's just going to be this added burden. Um, it's also this weird column by a guy named um, William Moyes. He's the, he runs this, his radio column called Behind the Mic. And he runs this really wacky column about getting in costume and sneaking over to the border blockade in Siskiyou County and trying to see sort of dressing himself up like a hobo and getting, bringing a, uh, what do you call it, a siphon so that he can siphon gas out of his car to make the cops want to arrest him because they think he's probably trying to like stretch out his gas supply or something like that. And it's all in service of this idea that this is much ado about nothing. You know, the, there's sort of a series of articles and columns from uh, Sky uh, Moyes that's essentially just saying, this is, there's nothing happening here. I don't know what everyone's worried about. I saw plenty of cars go by. But again, that goes back to this idea that like the inconvenience and the discomfort of being stopped and booked and fingerprinted and let alone the fact that this guy's sort of dressing up as a uh, quote unquote hobo makes it a little bit of a suspect column. And it's funny because this kind of undercover work is sort of happening on the other side as well. It's happening in terms of like social workers who are riding the rails and going to see how social service agencies are delivering aid and delivering relief. So it's sort of a complicated scenario. Um, so let's move on. Um, I'm getting close to the end and the time for questions, but I just wanted to like really quickly start to like show how the responses kind of start to happen. You know, these organizations are starting to get, sorry, municipalities are starting to sort of notice that they're getting this pushback and they're like, what's gonna happen if we suddenly have all of these transients coming back and trying to seek aid in our situation? So motivated somewhat by that, but definitely articulated in a certain progressive veneer is this idea of, you know, sort of declaring an opposition to, to the blockade. And it starts here in Portland, 400 miles or so from the California border uh, by Commissioner Ralph Clyde, a sort of progressive advocate of public power who's um, thinking about running for mayor and is trying to sort of take this political stand. And in this city council statement, this resolution, which was adopted by the council, uh, I think it was, I don't remember, but it was, a con I don't remember the numbers offhand, but it was a certain, um, it wasn't a unanimous uh, condemnation. In fact, the mayor was one who uh, opposed it, um, but it does pass, can't do anything. And the Oregonians quick to criticize Cl Clyde as sort of setting himself up as an opposition without really any power. Um, but what it does is it sort of reiterates something that I think still happens today, where Portland projects this sort of outward progressive face of, especially when it comes to dealing with poverty and homelessness, while it takes regressive and dehumanizing actions within. I mean, again, I think I mentioned earlier that just three weeks earlier, there had been these efforts to kick people out of the, um, one of the transit camps. Now that was at the county level here in Multnomah County, but in the fall, uh, the, the police chief at the time, Harry Niles had ordered his officers to basically, as soon as the uh, FIRA program, the relief program shut down here in Oregon, he starts ordering people to, his police to keep a lookout for what he calls vagrant beggars and you know, telling them to start arresting anyone who looks like they're loitering and poor on the city streets. So, you know, Portland is also having this tension of, let's say we're progressive and we stand up for the common man and all of this, but let's maybe not really do that when it comes to what's happening around us. 
And that again is sort of the reaction that other cities are having, having but other cities do sort of adopt similar resolutions. Uh, Klamath Falls, I'm not actually not sure about Klamath Falls, but Grants Pass and, and Ashland definitely pass resolutions condemning the blockade, often using the same language. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have much of an impact. This is a sort of extra legal, extra judicial operation happening in California. In fact, some of the civil liberties challenges to it are struck down because, precisely because they're not done with the authority of the state of California. It's this weird legal decision that I actually just read yesterday and I was just kind of mind blown about it because I'm not a lawyer. Um, but what does happen is in Modoc County in Northeastern California, Sheriff John Christopher Sharp, Sharp refuses to go along with the blockade and he doesn't allow the LAPD officers who come to Modoc County to station themselves out, out there you know, just south of, uh, just around Tula Lake, where, of course, the Japanese internment camp will be in just a few short years. But that creates another sort of round of anti-Los Angeles, anti-Davis publicity. And at the same time, it's just sort of bleeding money. So this operation is getting a lot of publicity, but it's losing money. It shuts down about six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks after it starts, but there's still a tremendous amount of, um, you know, issues surrounding migration. Let's go to the last, the second to last slide. Um, this one. Okay, so this is about a, this is just a quick mention about a case called Edwards versus California. About three in 1939, I believe, uh, California passes a rule that sort of reinforces this idea of you can't be an indigent person and come into the state of California or assist someone coming into the state of California if they are going to likely become a public charge. Um, this guy Edwards. Uh, I don't believe I, I, he's the guy who brings him in. I think it's another person who, who comes to say, but anyway, Edwards comes from Texas to Marysville, California, and maybe Yuba City, somewhere around there, and, and he's looking for work, and he's arrested, and he's charged with violating this Indigent Act, and it goes all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, um, and it's challenged sort of on this idea that you know, it's funny, it's, um, he wins his appeals and he wins, wins in the Supreme Court, but there's sort of three separate constitutional issues, three separate sort of concurring decisions that are released in the case that sort of reaffirm the right of people to travel across state lines, regardless of their sort of economic status or any other status, you know, they basically just reinforces the idea that if you're in the United States, you can go anywhere you want in the United States. And that will completely shift the way that this sort of migration issue, at least within the country, takes place. Um, so that's sort of this sort of a wind down. It, this, that's actually not decided until about two weeks before Pearl Harbor. So it's uh, not something that we often remember unless this is a sort of area of, of focus for us. Um, okay, so one more slide. Uh, so these roadblocks continue, of course. You know, today, when I first learned about this, I kept thinking about, this was in 2018, I kept thinking about the way that the bum blockade or the border, the foreign legion, whatever you want to call it, was relevant to today. Um, you know, if I still kept physical folders of news clippings of things that are interest, related to research I'm doing, they'd be bursting by now. Um, you know, we see here, and in other cities, we see stories about wannabe vigilantes torching encampments of houseless people. We see dehumanizing sweeps of these people. We see civic leaders talking about how homelessness hurts the quality of life in their cities, but not the quality of life of those people who are experiencing homelessness, the quality of life of people who don't want to witness it. And I think it's still on our minds. I mean, whether that response informs like the sort of progressive identity that we think about, you know, Oregon's had this sort of idea of itself as a progressive state that's really interested in people's rights and really interested in doing right by people. And yet it's also a state where sit lie ordinances are common, where all sorts of cities are, you know, 
trying to prevent camping. And now we're starting to see this blowback, this third story, you know, that OPB just did earlier this week about House Bill 3115 you know, where the state legislature is finally going to start to say, like, well, let's, let's think more about these bans on homeless camping. And yet it's literally 85 years after this blockade happened. And we're still not able to quite like change how we think of people who we think don't belong in our community just because they're poor. And who we, we still have this sort of language of what kind of impact are they going to have us? Are they going to be a drain on our society? And this has been happening for years. It was happening during the Trump administration, and it's still happening now. It was happening during the um, Obama administration. It was happening during the Bush administration, on and on and on. And I think I just want to close with this last thing, and then I'll answer some questions. I'll probably have better answers than I've, you know, than probably left out a lot of stuff. I think the news that, that like, you know, we're dealing with right now, all the various like travel restrictions and the public life that we've sort of missed out on and all of the political discord we have right now. Um, I wonder if we could like better understand our relationship with our neighbors and our country and one another, if we better spent more time like looking at how we value these kinds of relationships and, and this kind of interchange during the Great Depression and like, whether when we stop to sort of demand sort of like local responses or to get the federal government off our backs, you know, what do we lose when we do that? What sort of like ease and facility do we lose in that sense? And, you know, I just wanted to say that, you know, a lot of people sort of dismiss the blockade that the LAPD operated as sort of a PR stunt. In fact, that was a lot of the rhetoric that was used against it at the time. But, you know, even if it was a PR stunt, I don't think it was any less significant an attempt by James Davis or anyone else to circumvent constitutional protections. And just that, you know, the blockade, blockade even happened in the incendiary political climate of the 1930s and the world underscores just how much was at stake. And, you know, as the events of January 6th reminded us, we often re understand how near we tread to catastrophe in sort of like the crucial moments when we finally steer away from it. And it's sort of only then when like the water's breaking above the shore that we like kind of understand the tumult that's like right beneath us. And so I think that even though we don't have like a lot of cases of like documented abuses and we don't really know about this blockade, it's still sort of like this outrageous act that could have really changed the way that life happens in this country. And as much as I don't like Charles Martin's reasonings for opposing the blockade. I think he's kind of right. Like I think if states started implementing blockades like this, we might very well have had a situation very similar to what happened in Europe. Anyhow, um, that's all I got for right now. I want to thank you all for your time and I really appreciate you guys listening to me. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thanks so much, Bill. Really appreciate that. I'll leave this last um, slide up for a minute just so folks can make sure they get the contact information. And we've got a couple great questions already. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, one question has to do with some of the context that you were providing earlier yeah. in the talk. You were talking about the Hoovervilles. Um, yeah. And this idea of when when camps of folks who who don't have stable housing, if they're organizing that housing on their own or if it's organized from without. Um, so this listener was hearing you say that they're more tenuous when they're when they're formed from within rather than from without. And could you just speak a little bit more about that, the tenuous nature of those Hoovervilles? And I mean, I would just also say, you know, this is this is part of the news in Portland a lot these days and looking at Hazel Neck Grove and and it's, you know, camps that have been in Portland and organized in community. Um, for many years here and the tenuous nature of those. So if you want to talk about both the historic and the and any comparisons you might have with contemporary, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know as much as I probably should in this topic on the contemporary situation. I really would like to to get into that a little more deeply. But what I meant by tenuousness is, you know, most of these Hoovervilles are sort of being developed on land that's not being used for something else. And so it's always conditional. It's always at risk of being being them being cleared out. And there's there's you know there's no it's such a weird term, but there's 
they have no right to the land in the sort of legal and then that, especially in the understanding of the 1930s, it's just people are like, we need to build something, there's some spare stuff. I mean, the original, some of the original Hoovervilles in Chicago were just using like construction material from some nearby, I think it was dockyards or something like that, you know, and I'm sure that was the case, you know, um, I don't, again, I don't know quite as much as I probably should about how they formed here in Portland, but I think, I guess what I meant is, um, there's a sort of like self, I, I, I guess I just mean it's always, it's just, it's always living outside the boundaries. It's always, you know, there's, there's always a risk of a crackdown. I mean, this whole topic is essentially about legality and what is and is not legal and what is and is not uh, mandated. So. I don't know if this is really answering the question, but I think it's just that I just don't have that much confidence that, um, you now we see things like a commissary and we see economies form, but I think that's just because there's just not enough of an apparatus elsewhere to quote unquote do anything about it um, and to respond to it. And once there is, or once that land's needed, then, then it's dealt with. And I think, I mean, we see it right now. I live in a neighborhood where um, there are, quite a few numbers of people like who live in cars nearby or who like and you constantly see this sort of attitude that from from nearby people when is the city going to do something the city's too busy doing other stuff and i think um you know i i've never lived i've never not had a house so i don't know what it's like to live and how uncertain it is so i don't want to make any claims about the uncertainty but um i do find that you know, just the fact that the Hoovervilles are eventually cleared away once that land has a use, it's, it, it seems tenuous to me. Yeah, I think that makes sense just from some of the, um, the organized communities in Portland that I'm aware of over the past 20 years, you know, sometimes communities will organize in a particular space on their own, Dignity Village or Right to Dream 2, mm -hmm. um, and then um, the city will move them to a different place or disband mm -hmm. them. So I could see how that, um, once the once the city has given official sanction in a particular place, there's some extra level of protection. Um, even mm -hmm. though I think, you know, many folks would make the argument that when people in houseless communities organize themselves, the way they organize is much more stable than when somebody comes mm -hmm. from the outside. But they yeah. don't have that same kind of protection. So that's interesting. We've got I saw that great... comment come through, and I was thinking about that. Yeah. 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 We've got a great question um, from Facebook about uh, okay. Woody Guthrie, who was the mm -hmm. famous musician and Oki uh, called Portland a company town during the 1930s. And um, the, the audience member wants to know from your research, what have you found that would create a greater understanding of that characterization of Portland as a company town during the 1930s? Mm. You know, I don't think I've, I, I actually sort of consciously have steered away and because my book is about the broader blockade i haven't gone that deeply into portland uh portland history and so anything i would say in response would be sort of my like absorbed understanding of the role of the uh the, the timber industry and the longshoremen and the you know there were the longshore strikes in 1934 which really impacted the sort of the, you know it was a vicious experience I, I just don't know if i'd have the confidence to say how much of a company town it was and who was in control and how much you know private industry was in charge except to know that there was that kind of flare-up happening somewhat regularly and um i think the one thing worth there was something i, I had there but I, I think i kind of lost it it's just that oh yeah you know, there's sort of this undercurrent happening here in the 1930s too of, of anti-fascism that that uh, that is discussed sometimes in the response. And there's this discussion of the blockade as a fascist operation that happens uh, among activists at the time. And I think it grows out of some of that labor strife that happened, you know, earlier in the 30s. Um, and the reason I'm thinking of it right now is I'm thinking of the I think it's called the MDEN. It was a German, it was a Nazi ship that pulled up into. Uh, on an official visit to Portland in January of 1936, and it was welcomed with high regalia, and there was a there was a small protest, um, yeah. but that was sort of on my mind. I didn't really have the time in my research for this talk to go back and say like, 
if the forces who protested the MDAN went ahead and then protested the uh, the blockade, but that's about as much as I can confidently say on this topic. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. We have a great blog post at ohs.org mm -hmm. slash blog about that, uh, that Nazi ship showing up in Portland and some of the debates between protesters and police about who would get authorized for a um, for a march at that time. So definitely recommend folks looking that up. You know, it's interesting that, um, you know, one of our listeners was commenting that 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 this, there's a sort of narrative in the 21st century that there mm -hmm. is more houselessness in Oregon because neighboring states um, push people out and send them here. And I think, you know, we've all read, I think, in recent years, that narrative about um, people being given tickets to go somewhere from Portland mm -hmm. and, you know, what, do, are they really certain that they have somewhere to go that's that's safe and they can be cared for? Or is this just kicking people out, you know, um, which I think is interesting. Have you found more in your research other than this blockade of this sort of um, states or, or municipalities trying to push populations from one place to another? Or is this really sort of a, a singular event? Oh yeah, I mean, there are a lot of instances of there's some of just, for example, in the blockade of people being put on boxcars and sent back in, you know, in, in Southern California to Arizona, or in some cases, bought bus tickets or things like that. And then there are some cases where in other states, you know, in Florida had its own blockade, uh, state run blockade in a couple months after, uh, after the one in California, Colorado started one using the National Guard, mostly on the Southern border, um, and actually a little bit more racialized in terms of they were targeting who they called Mexicans. Again, it was people from New Mexico and anyone who was brown uh, that they considered that they would have identified as uh, as Mexican and, and turned that way. Uh, so it was a little more complicated. So there's this sort of, but there is a mobilization of the National Guard to keep out um, uh, mostly homeless people or just poor people from the state. And even Nome, Alaska, there's this one little piece that I found in can't remember what publication I think it was a you know it was a wire story and it they they read this little story saying that they're going to keep migrants out of their state you know it's just this I'm not their it's not a state it's a territory but out of their city mm -hmm. it it sort of becomes this thing and there is some of that yeah like sending people away gently in terms of buying tickets but mostly it's you know turn around get out of here and sometimes that means walking across the desert or um you know getting on a boxcar and not being allowed into the next state. That was, again, the concern in California. It was the, I mean, in Oregon, it was a concern in Arizona. So you you have this sort of use of the, um, uh, I mean, migrants are almost, almost become, it's a sort of a horrible word today, they almost become chattel, you know, and it's not quite, you know, they're not being used, they're not being sold the way that enslaved people are, but they are certainly dehumanized. Well, I mean, I think that's, we had a, a, an amazing talk um, by historian Erica Lee a few months ago talking about the history of xenophobia as central to the history of the United States. And really mm -hmm. that idea that um, the United States always wants laborers and so is happy mm -hmm. to bring people in to create wealth for other people, but doesn't necessarily want to provide rights or equality or stability or citizenship. And so, you know, I think this it's very interesting this history where you have that that state to state blockade really does drive home um that point in a much different way um, right? yeah and i mean it's interesting that you you mentioned labor because i mean labor is in that sense is because that's some of the rhetoric that is used about the blockade here in oregon in say like editorials is it's actually they very explicitly say well california is happy to have you know foreign laborers come in here and and you know but they don't and come into their state, even though they said they, you know, despite the deportations that happen, they're happy to pay very small rates, but they don't want these, you know, people from the rest of the country to come in. So there's that sort of xenophobia sort of getting layered at the time. And it's really, it really gets strange and complex, especially when you talk about people talking about constitutional protections, but then, but not for these people, you know. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, it's interesting, you know, we started this program talking about um, the fact that we're on indigenous land, really, and mm -hmm. thinking about that, that history of, of land theft and, and property um, ownership and, and theft 
um, and really the ways that what you're talking about continues on with that um, mm -hmm. right, in really fascinating ways about who has a right to what space um, and who decides that right. So thank you very much for this thank really you. interesting program. Yeah. We'll be looking forward to the book and we appreciate mm -hmm. the opportunity for a sneak preview um, and appreciate all your good research and attention to this subject. So thank you for having thanks. me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks everyone for joining us this evening and we'll see you at the next program. Sign up for our email list if you're not on it already. Follow Bill and OHS on social media and thanks for your time and attention this evening. Take care everybody. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>